My name is Jean Frenet. I am from uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. Fortunate enough that there was a good karate instructor in my town, and that's how I got started in, uh, in karate training. That took me, you know, competition level, uh, high level international and everything else, and I was fortunate to have some really good sensei in my, uh, in my karate life to this day. Uh, including uh, my first karate teacher, Maxime Mazaltarim. He's originally from France, but it was, uh, he was uh, immigrated in uh, Canada back in the uh, mid 60s. And then Sensei Chuck Merriman until his passing uh, recently, where we had his funeral uh, not too long ago in Okinawa. And obviously, through Sensei Merriman, uh, we were introduced to Jun Do Kan, uh, where we've been training for 30 years almost now. And, uh, Again, had the amazing opportunity to train uh, with uh, Miyazato Sensei, Iha Sensei, Ichiya Sensei, and all the senior students from Miyazato Sensei's uh, dojo, Jundokan. People know me a lot because of my demonstration, you know, uh, with the music and all that. But I had a really good, strong traditional background before I moved into those type of competition and exhibition. My mind anyway was always like, once I'm done with the competition time, I want to trace back the roots of karate. And uh, through Sensei Merman, obviously, he was the perfect uh, man for that. And uh, that's how I, we went, we came to Okinawa. So now training in Okinawa for me was like, okay, finally, you know, I'm doing it, I'm gonna do it the right way, you know, and uh, learning every, every small details, Miyazato Sensei, would, you know, did not speak English, but it would be ko, 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 do this, do that. And then just that it was an eye opener. So for me to come to Okinawa was like uh, coming home in a way as, as a karateka and also discovering, you know, not only the, the, the art, but the culture and the people in Okinawa that are so amazing. Miyazato Sensei was a man of a few words, you know. Even in English, I could see, I mean, in Japanese, I could see, you know, uh, when he would talk to the, uh, the other uh, seniors, it was very precise, very direct. So I remember even when I was coming, you know, like uh, twice a year, spend a month at a time here, and I would come to the dojo during the day, you know, you know especially in the January or February, there's nobody, there's no foreign students, I'm the only the only guy from out of town. And so I would come in the morning, afternoon and evening. So morning, afternoon, I'm just alone. So I would come in and Sensei would be there, uh, would do uh, warm up, Junbi Undo, a little bit of Hojo Undo, and then start doing Kata. And then he would come and ask me to do one Kata. And he would correct me, then he would go away upstairs. And then I know you gotta keep on training because he's gonna show up at some point. So now there I am, I'm training and I'm looking in the mirror to try to auto-correct myself. And then I turn around just to go get some water and then who I see up there is Miyazato Sensei is watching. So he would always come with some very, he's always there, come in and clarify, you know, this way or this way. And then you go back and just drill, 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 drill. So, it, it, so he had a good sense of humor at the same time, you know. So as much as he looks serious, but he had a good sense of humor. Miyazoto Sensei would always emphasize on the, the Gojuru principle that he learned from Chojun Miyagi Sensei. The one that would come up all the time is Gojuru is hard and soft, but it's more Ju than Go. So we always talk about 80, 90% Ju and 10, 20% Go, which is your Kime, your explosion. So we always correct, you know, how you do your internal uh, energy uh, work in, in the kata. Like Seon Chin, for instance, it's like, it's, like, uh, it's like music almost because you get the high notes, you get the in internal breathing, you get the contraction, the explosion, the relaxation. So all of these elements would always come up in discussion and in during training to correct us, you know, and that was very, uh, very important uh, teachings from Mia Sensei. Team sports, if, if you lose, you can blame anybody around. In, in Budo, in martial art, if you lose, it's you. you. You don't blame. So the responsibility, how you become responsible for your own person, it's, it's way bigger. It has a bigger impact in your life. So that was the number one thing for me, even as a, young, as a child. Uh, I love the fact that in karate you can express yourself. Like some people, that, without making, uh, saying it's the same thing, but dancing, 
you know? Karate is the same way, so it's very set, like the katas are very set and stone, but you still can express yourself through your kata. Uh, that's why Mizato Sensei was also, it eventually becomes your kata. Remember, Merriman Sensei would say the same thing. So it's an art, it's an art form, so it becomes you. Uh, when I was young, I did some theater, I did some Muppet voice and things like that. So I was always attracted to show or spectacle or, you know, not young for camera. You later, the camera and the film work came later, but I was already attracted to demonstrate. And it felt like in karate I can demonstrate, you know, my, my art, what I practice through, specifically through kata. And that took me to the level where I started to compete in the U.S., and I saw this new trend about the musical form. So this is where I said, okay, this, this, is, a, this, is, this is for me. Because I could, I could see how, you know, coming outside of the, uh, the, the structure of a kata, the set kata with the choreography, you cannot move anything of that. You, gotta, you don't touch it. This format was perfect because I could create my own. So then comes the creativity. This is where you realize that, oh, you got so many ideas, you can push your body limit to another level, like flexibility and kicking and you know combination that you would do that you would not do in the traditional kata because in respect of, you have to, to stay through to the, uh, to the art. So the open musical form was a good form to express myself. So coming from a young age, doing a little bit of theater, voice, looking for that moment of opportunity to be able to express myself through my art. So that's basically what I did. And then by doing so, you start to develop and you start to be a bit more curious about other arts, you know. Uh, Sometimes I think some people make mistakes of just like being very, uh, very one track mind about uh, their training and it's good to know other things and to learn. Then you realize that they're all linked together and it takes you to the same three. So my, my, my uh, curiosity pushed me to, okay, how does it work in Taekwondo? And, and you know, obviously Aikido and Yaido and, and different arts, you know, even the Kali and everything else that I could, that could help my creativity, open some doors, open the doors and thinking outside the box to express my creativity. So that came all, at, all around the same time when I discovered the musical form. So that took me to uh, another, uh, another dimension of doing this. But parallel to that, if it was a Zenkutsu Dachi or a Maigiri or a Tsuki or whatever combination I would create, I would still stick with the principles. The only thing you would see is like if you see a high kick and a 180 degree side kick or round kick like 20 times in a few seconds, that's just to show how you can train your body to be able to do certain things. So not limiting yourself. So, and obviously by doing so, that took me to be very curious about the film and the television industry where I could, again, express myself by designing and choreographing and, and, and executing, you know, uh, fight sequences. And this is where, uh, this is where the whole, another story starts. <laughs> Going from doing exhibition for live audience, you know, like in, in tournaments, but I used to do it also in championship where they have the nighttime final. So before the nighttime final, there's some demonstration. So I would choreograph some little sequence, make a little story, have two or three of my students, and we put together a fight sequence with some music and wardrobe and everything else. So it was already happening in me. But my first experience with camera was in 1976, where with my first karate instructor, we did a documentary about karate. And so we were doing our, all the katas and different, different, uh, you know, like a ipon kumite and, you know, like a different type of exercise with partners to demonstrate the art. So that was my first encounter working with camera. And then after that, I'd done a whole bunch of things like 77, 78, 79. Every year I was doing like talk shows where I would do exhibition again, like I was doing in tournaments, but for TV. So you start to understand the camera work and how, you know, how big you have to move, how small you have to move. Like audience is like theater. So if you do a live show, it's, it's like, I always use the expression, you shoot with a 12 gauge because you're gonna shoot like this because theater you have to project. But with camera, it's very tight. So you don't have to do big movement. You have to be very uh, precise. You know, it's like a laser, like a nine mil. So very different approach. So to understand those two things and knowing when, when to go big and when to stay, to stay small, that was the whole fruit from you know, uh, doing the TV work. So to understand that. So fast forward, 1980, 81, I'm doing the US circuit competition. Uh, two of my other friends, Stuart Kwan and Gary Michak. We, uh, 
we went to the Long Beach International uh, tournament over there. First time in California. And, you know, you s now everything is like amazing to see because uh, it's Los Angeles and all that. And so after we're done with the tournament, we just you know, want to stay in, like, an extra week just to enjoy California. And so we're driving back on Pico Boulevard, which is, goes from the Mount the Hills to the, to the beach. Driving back towards the beach, we're off to Santa Monica and red light. There's a studio there, Century Fox, and there's a big billboard that says The Fall Guy. So there was a TV series, The Fall Guy, with Lee Major, who's a stuntman, blah, blah, blah. He's the one uh, on the side job. He was doing the pri private detective thing. So uh, we were talking. Was, that, that's the duration of a red light. So we're talking about this. That would be great to get in the movies and do some, you know, like fight choreographies and stunts and all that. And we go, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And then we realized that The Fall Guy, there was somebody we knew that was doing the fights was Pat Johnson. So, and we knew Pat because Pat was there sometime to, as a referee uh, in the circuit in the US. So, we took a bet between the three of us. I said, okay, we said, let's see who's gonna be the first one to get in the industry. The light goes green, we go to the beach, and then I come, back, I come back a week later to Montreal and I'm driving and I hear on the radio station that they're doing a casting for a movie called Meatballs. So I'm like, oh, this is the chance, right? So I go to the casting office, I put my material, I meet with the secretary there, so you know, the coordinator there in the meeting right now, but he's gonna come out soon, so if you wanna stick around, you can introduce yourself. So he comes out, and uh, there was this guy who's my mentor still today, uh, his name is uh, Dave Rigby. He's a Canadian guy, but he works a lot between Montreal and Toronto, he's the guy that got me in the industry, with an American uh, stunt coordinator who passed away now. And uh, so I present myself, say, hey, this is what I do. I, I, used, I did gymnastic too uh, for many years, so I did, I'm an acrobatic and martial art background. He says, well, sorry for this movie, we, it's only cars and uh, horses, so this is not, but in about six months we get something else. It's all about fights and stuff, and he says, we'll, we'll be in touch. So I'm like, okay, thank you very much. But you know, always think that, yeah, you know, don't call us, we'll call you type of thing. But no, sure enough, calls me up five months ago, John, uh, we got this thing going on, uh, let's meet up and see what uh, we can do. And that's how I started. So my first appearance on camera was for a music video called Victim of a Fantasy by Stephen Tracy. Fighting, guys was catching on fire, going over the bar, that'd be a typical bar fight. We did that music video and uh, not long after, he calls me at home on a Sunday night. He goes, uh, oh, John, where are you? I'm, I just got back. I'm in Montreal. He goes, uh, can you be here tomorrow morning in Toronto? I'm like, so I take the, I take the train overnight. He picked me up, takes me to the office. So we're waiting. I said, what's going on? He says, well, this, this, we're doing this movie, Police Academy. And the producer saw you on TV in the U.S. Oh, I've seen this guy. It's a French name. He's a high kicker, blah, blah, blah. Be great for what we need. And... That's how I got the job. So because Rigby knew me and he was the coordinator on the show and I, that's how I got the job on Police Academy 3. And then after that, I stayed on the show till the end. I was training the actors and the, the executive and all that. And then we did Police Academy 4. And then it snowballed, you know, after year after year, and just uh, getting more and more opportunity to work on camera, learning, you know, the different aspect of filmmaking, because it's one thing to, uh, to understand, you know, what you have to do, but yes, understand the overall process, you know, what the DP does, what wardrobe, art department, you know, editing, you know, and so on and so forth, so. After now 40 years in the film industry, I've done a completed 190 movies now and over 250 episodes of TV series. But my best souvenir, like the one that had the, the, the greatest experience, definitely is uh, 300 uh, Immortals, uh, you know, TV series like uh, Jack Ryan season one, Jack Reacher, uh, Reacher uh, Quantico season one. I mean, I've done so many. The Day After Tomorrow, you know, Mirror Mirror, uh, Mortal Instrument, Pompeii, Polar for Netflix. And there's so many of them that, you know, and then some big blockbusters, some not as well known. And now a lot, of, a lot of the project that we do is a lot for Netflix or Amazon. So it doesn't go in theaters, it goes on streamers, but still getting like millions of views, which is very uh, uh, successful considering in, in, in this new world. And there's more stuff coming up, so which is uh, very exciting. Parallel to that, 
I always felt like I've been teaching karate. I have my dojo now for 40 years. And uh, it feels to me like I cannot keep my, you know, the knowledge I got over the years, whether from Mr. Merriman, Mia Sensei, Ya Sensei, and everybody, I have to communicate that. So that's why I've been teaching for so many years. But I've done the same thing with stunts. I started like a stunt training facility school uh, in Montreal and Toronto, where I could start and train and bring a new generation up. Because as you can guess, you know, your body takes a beating doing stunts and eventually you know, you start to be a bit more picky on the type of stunt you're going to do because your body, is, you know, you're taking a lot of hits. So even if the, the safety is, is much better than 20, 30 years ago, you still have to hit the deck. So when you fall, you fall. It's gravity. So uh, by training a new generation, you know, and also try to make them smarter than we were back then, you know, to enter the industry with a good uh, preparation, a good mindset, you know, to enter the industry because, you know, we all get older and you need, you need new generation. There's project, I had a project like a project called Blue Mountain State for Vice Television. And uh, I need like football players, like, you know, college football between 19 and 21, 22 years old. So a lot of the stunt guys are older than that. So you can't use the, the established stunt people because they look, too, they look older. That doesn't mean they look old but they're older than what they're looking for. So you have no choice than to start training people. So that, that's how it came for me. I'm like, okay, we gotta do something about this. And, and I've trained like a whole bunch of people and had people from Cirque du Soleil that came and trained with us that we, that transfer into the stunts. And so it's, it's, a, it's not an easy thing, you know, to do, but if, if the person is willing to learn and, and uh, change habits, because from martial art to the camera, you have to change the way you're gonna punch. And gymnastic is the same thing, you know. It, most of the time you fall, you fall on your back, you fall on your chest, you don't fall on your feet. So you gotta, you gotta lose that habit of being so perfect with the pointed toes and the hands and everything and to be able to make it like you don't wanna die or you don't wanna fall. So the body language, you know, is very different. So, and that's how we call it. It's, it's like a, it's a vocabulary, you know. It's it, the language of, of, of stunts, body language, physical acting. What's interesting is like, you know, in terms of creativity, you know, you always go back to what you learn and how you can alter it. Or sometimes it fits perfect for the scene or whatever you have to do. Like, you know, training, uh, you know, when you train in karate in general, you do a little bit of kobudo as well. So, which I did. I did. I trained for many years with uh, Sensei Fumio Dimura, uh, Toyotaro Miyazaki in New York and in California with uh, Dimura Sensei. And, uh, and then also did some kobudo back when the, the, the first years I came here with uh, Matayoshi Shimpo and through my friend uh, Zene Oshiro that is also with uh, Matayoshi Ryu, but he's in France, so I used to see him all the time. So taking, taking that knowledge, you know, and how I can, I can use the, those weapons or those uh, tools sometime in the film industry. It happens very often, you know? And uh, for instance, like in uh, Immortals, uh, the director, you know, says, okay, well, I wanna give some weapons to all the gods, right? So Zeus was one thing, when I mean, we had the whip, which was interesting. But then uh, Henry, when he was fighting earlier to go save his mother, it was, a, it was a, like a staff. So I said, why don't you have like a, a blade? or something that was made up from stone, you know, and it's kind of a sharpie edge, looked like a knife or a blade, but it could be like more rustic. So we did that. So that's why when you see Henry doing all this, this fight stuff, fighting the guys and doing bow technique, you know, to go save his mother, that was, that was really much inspired from, you know, Okinawa and, you know, Kobudo. Uh, same thing we did with, uh, with Isabel. We, you want to have something sharp, sickle or something. And I had designed something, I had designed something where you had, you had the, 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 the comma that we know and, and another one lower, a bit like this. So I said, because then you, you can do both ways and you can slash this way, come back, et cetera. And, uh, but he decides, no, no, just take out, just keep, keep it like you have it in, the, in your martial art. I'm like, okay, all right. There's nothing to do with the gods in Greece, but it works. So still talking about weapons and sometimes how we use weapon or sometimes how we can use a broken weapon. And that's what happened when we did uh, the sequence in the tunnel in Immortal with uh, Henry where he has the spear and he stabs one. He has no time 
to pull it out because as more guys come in, he just said, so I came up with the idea, break that, that part and then stab with the other part and then break and then stab again. So, you know, if even a broken bow with a sharp edge is a weapon. So that's, this is where, you know, we're going when we get creative about, uh, you know, uh, designing the action. And then to go back in time, you know, like training wise for the actors, whether it's a guy like Henry or Jerry Butler in 300 and, you know, Mads Mikkelsen in, in, in some case I work with him. Uh, most of the people, they have to train. Some people, some actors train on a regular basis. Most of them, you know, they will train for the movie. But in our case, it's three months before three months before. <laughs> Basically meaning like, for instance, for Henry he trained for a couple months in England before he came to us. Then we did another two and a half months of training, rehearsing, and then start filming. And then you have to maintain that, the look, the physical look, and also the, the condition, the stamina, because you know, when we do fights, you do fights 12, 14 hours a day, and just, okay, cut, reset, we go again, roll in camera, boom, and we go again. So that is part of the training that we do months before, you know. And if we need, you know, the actor to get a bit bigger, so then the nutrition comes in turn. You know, what kind of food, you know, so we have special chefs, some, sometimes we hire and cater, you know, all these meals, six meals a day, you know, the training. We did some CrossFit uh, almost every day, Tabata every day, and then fight training nonstop. Drill, 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 stance, and everything. So it's, it's a big, big, big job, you know. And some people, some people have a hard time. They're not as well coordinated than others, you know. But most of the time, the leads, you know, they come in prepared, uh, physically but mentally as well, knowing what they're getting into. It's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be intense. And what, what is great about this is like when we start training with all the actors and the stunt crew, we all train, we spend days together, day in, day out, you know, like 8 a.m. till 5, 6 p.m., Next morning, same thing, five days a week. So there's a bond that is created between the stunt team, the stunt doubles of the actors, good relationship, and the actors. So you have to have that trust because when you start fighting, even if it's fake weapons, you don't want to get hit over the head. You don't want to get poked in the eye. So you got to trust the people you're training with. And if you have a blank, you forget about a movement, that stunt person is going to be able to adapt and move and not attack you if you're not ready. Because we see it in the eyes. Sometimes you go, oh, he has a blank. And it's normal. It happens. You know, it just reset right away, repo, boom, and we go again. But that relationship between the stunt crew and the actor is extremely important. That's why we build that bond. So it's very important. If you go back in the 70s when you watch uh, Charles Bronson or, you know, any of those movies, uh, like Clint Eastwood and all that, it was more gun. Uh, a bit of fighting, but pretty straightforward, and there was no trick camera move or anything like that. It was like very uh, traditional filmmaking, you know, reverse angle and, you know, wide and some medium and the good cheats, everything was working well. Then you get into the 80s. The 80s where you start to have more of a martial art uh, trend happening into movies. This is where you had like, you know, obviously Chuck Norris. Chuck started in the 70s, but carried on into the, uh, the 80s. Jean-Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, you know, in North America. And you could, you could see the difference now change. Like Jean-Claude brought in like the nice kicking, the flair, the body, you know, a body of a bodybuilder kind of, but with the finesse and the souplesse of a, of a ballet dancer with some martial art background, obviously. And so Jean-Claude would bring in that, that new trend, that flair, that visual of kicking you know, that we haven't seen before. Like you would see with Chuck more straight to the point, a good side kick, a front kick, you know, a knee strike, as opposed to Jean-Claude was more like fancy, it was fancier, eye candy. And uh, the way it was shot changed as well. Like he would do repeat different angle, the same kick, and he would cut to repeat to enhance, you know, that moment, which uh, also has to do with the, the way you shoot it and the way you edit it as well. But then after that, we move forward into uh, the Hong Kong era where all the Jackie Chan movies and then Jet Li and, you know, and now Donnie Yen and all that. So, and th all those movies, they were very popular, inspired a lot, like the, you know, the Wachowski brothers in terms of choreography from Matrix and all that, or Kill Bill, you know, for instance, from uh, Tarantino. Whooping, who was the guy, you know, uh, still is amazing, you know, action director and choreographer. 
but it's, it's like a trend, you know. It was very popular, more onto the, the unreal world, surreal world, fantastic world, legends, you know, like many of the Chinese movies. To then come down to, we had the, uh, the parkour was very popular at some point from 2005 about, with uh, District B13 from France, amazing film. So that created another trend. Then Hong Bak came out, you know, with Tony Jaa, with the more hard hitting, you know. Uh, that did make change a little bit the approach of the choreography and also, again, the way you shoot it and, uh, and then the, uh, the editing. Then fast forward into uh, the influence of UFC, trying to bring some of that realism into, into uh, the choreography, which, you know, that's a big, it's not an easy thing to do because two, two people fighting on the ground, grappling, how do you photograph that? How do you make it exciting? So sometimes you will have to change a little bit the, uh, the movement or uh, the combination of it. That would not be the ideal thing in the ring, but it works for camera. So you still have to adapt, you know? Push forward now today, the demand is realism. You get hit, it hurts. And it's not like some of the other movies that we've done, seen before. They fight for five minutes, nobody's bleeding, nobody's out of breath, they don't have, you know. As opposed to now, if you get hurt in the fight, you're carrying that wound, that, you know, you get kicked in the leg and you get, you know, you're limping. So the rest of the fight, you're gonna have a hard time with that leg. Or, you know, you get, get, get cut here, but you're bleeding and, or your finger's broken. And so more realism into the fights nowadays. And so you take, for instance, uh, Jack Ryan. When I did Jack Ryan, Jack Ryan, is an operative, you know, CIA operative, but more on the uh, computer because before he was, he was in the Marine, he did the service, he had some training, but he broke his back, he came back. So when he's fighting, he has basic training, he doesn't have like extensive training. So that's why his choreography is very different than Reacher, for instance, okay? So Jack Ryan will know enough to survive but not to be fancy or anything like that. He can grab anything around just to, to, to help himself, he's in trouble, you know? And he knows how to fight, but it's still limited, right? As opposed to Reacher. Reacher is a badass, you know? Big dude, heavy, heavy training into, uh, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, knives, guns, disarm, everything. And he's straight to the point. And he will do stuff that, you know, you would think is not fancy, a headbutt, an elbow, a knee, you know, a shoulder strike and then hit. Uh, choking, you know, stuff that is like straight to the point, very realistic. And, you know, when you see fights on YouTube or whatever in real life, it, it never lasts very long. So that's, where do you find the, the compromise? To tell the story without, you know, going too much on the realism that it's in a flash it happens and, oh, what happened? What happened? So it's just that, that, that give and take that you have to do in order to choreograph something that tells a story. So he has to stay truthful to the characters, you know. Sometimes you watch a movie and the guy is supposed to be a, a clerk and out of the blue now he's doing jump spinning kicks and back flips and it's like, where is that coming from, you know? So sometimes there's some decisions that are being made that are not, not really for the benefit of the movie. It's more, okay, I want to put something flashy or more impressive or whatever, but doesn't, it doesn't, you know, relate to the actor or the storyline, you know. So it's very important to understand that when we design action, it has to f fit with the story, not just stuff you would like to do because you've never done it and you, you think it would look good, but it doesn't fit the character, so, yeah. As I move uh, forward in my career, I'm still involved with stunts and action design, but directing more, producing, uh, there's a few things on my list, my wish list. Uh, one is really a movie about Okinawa and about a master it could be any of the, the really well known, but tell the story, you know, and a little bit like Last Samurai maybe, or, you know, but really, uh, really deep into the Okinawan culture and the impact, you know, also the idea of the cultural impact between uh, uh, somebody coming from the outside, coming in, how does that relate and what are the uh, friction and what are the confrontation and how, in both ways, in both sides. And I think that it's, it would be nice for the audience and the world to discover what Okinawa is really about, you know, and what they brought to the world, you know. So this is very important. But also there's the other one, which is more like reenactments, 
If you take the story of Chojun Miyagi, you know, uh, that we've heard, or Choki Motobu, or, you know, uh, Akamine, or whatever, that we can recreate, like, reenactment segments, you know, and the documentary format uh, of those great masters, the Bushi, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So I think there's, Okinawa has a lot to offer. I mean, it's an amazing place, amazing people, and everything is here. Zen training is uh, very interesting. Uh, I started, my first karate instructor was also teaching us Zen meditation. I was 14 years old. I felt very uh, in, much interested into it because of the, the contrast, you know, the contrast that I would get from sitting, breathing, the right posture, and, and then later on in life, you know, stress or whatever, that I could go back to that. That was the base of it, you know, where sitting, breathing, just calm down, bring everything to one. So that was the beginning of it back then. But then uh, over the years of, of traveling and, you know, competing and demonstrating, feeling, you know, sometimes the pressure, you know, because you get so much stuff going on, I could always go back to sitting, meditating, the posture, breathing again. And I always made the parallel to Sanchen. Uh, to me, like, Sanchen is like as active Zen in that sense because it comes, it comes down to the same thing. It's the posture, the breathing, the attention, you know, the moment right now. It's the same thing when you perform. You do your kata, it's just you moving. So it's, it's active. To me, it's active Zen. So, uh, so I always felt like there was a connection between the two and it was related. And then fast forward in life, when I start to come to Okinawa, I said, I got to find a, a, a Zendo, right? I start to walk up the uh, Kinjo Stone Road. And if I go up towards the Shuri Castle and I arrive on top of it, the castle is on, on the left. The temple is right there. I came to the door and Gasho come in. I go inside. Hello, Gashimas, anybody? You know, nobody there. So I wait for a little bit. Then I bow again and I turn around and who's there? Sakya Maroshi. It's like he appeared, like uh, I didn't hear him come, and he's, it was just, I turn around and he's there. And he goes, in English, he goes, uh, what are you looking for? That's a very Zen question. I'm looking for Zazen. Oh, where are you from? And we had this discussion. Then he goes, okay, come inside. And we had another discussion for about three hours about my motivation, where, and he was very surprised to see like somebody from, not from Okinawa, Japan, interested and knowing already about the, the, man, the sutras and the mantras and that uh, he says, okay, so uh, okay, he go, because he knew me as Ato Sensei because he, he was a karate person before the war. So at night I get a call from uh, Yoshi uh, and he says, okay, Mr. Fernet, you can come tomorrow morning. And now I was accepted to come and I would come back then, it was every morning six days a week plus Sunday was three hours with tea ceremonies and mundo everything right so I would do six hours of karate plus another hour every morning of zazen um, for me it's balance it's balance and it's very very important and it's so interconnected between the two when you when you talk about the principle of here and now and being in the moment that's exactly the same thing that uh, karateka should be when he's training is to be in that moment and when you're in that moment, you become one it makes a big difference you feel as a whole you know so all this philosophy of Zen you know uh, the idea of looking in the mirror what do you see in the mirror mirror doesn't lie mirror shows you exactly what it is right so all those teachings from uh, Sakya Maroshi the mind is always going the mind is always going so as, as long as you try to stop the mind you just got to let go if by letting go, you will stop thinking. By focusing on your breathing, on your posture, you're not thinking, you're just being there in the moment. And then start to let go the thinking, you know? And that's the hard part. That's why, you know, the motion concept comes in. Again, it's so close, it's so connected to the training that we do in Budo. I mean, we talk about Karate, but it's same for Kubudo, same for, for Yaido and Aikido and, you know, it's, it's, it goes together. It goes together. So conversation I had with Sakya Maroshi over the years has always been about Zen and Karate. Zen and Karate and in, in life, you know? And it's, it's all connected. So that's why, that's why I truly believe in that. And, 
I think it was very happy to see that somebody <laughs> would think the same way, you know. We've done like two documentary together, uh, one for France and one for National Geographic, which uh, we could introduce Sakyamoto. She also does then Rinzai, the school of Rinzai philosophy into uh, to the world. So, but uh, because of Sakyamoto, she being a karateka before the war, and the reason he became a Zen monk was very interesting because he trained, he used to train all the time, he loves karate. We would talk about it and have discussions about Chojo Miyagi Sensei and every, uh, Miyazato Sensei and all, he knew everybody. He went to the war and what he saw, the horror that he saw in the war made him say, when I, I oh, come back, I don't do anything violent. That's how he vowed to become a Zen monk. Yeah. So the discussions were very, very deep and very interesting and always making the link between Zen and Karate. Always. And it's, it's amazing. To see that is like, it's there, you know, there's no big change. That's why I'm saying it's active Zen, what we do. So thinking back, you know, I've, it's been almost like 30 years coming to Okinawa. Uh, and I can say it's my second home. Uh, coming here is, is always a pleasure. It doesn't matter how many hours on the plane. Once, once I arrive, I'm like, just free. Uh, I love Okinawa for many, many reasons. Uh, you know, obviously for training, but uh, people, people make you feel good, make you feel welcome. And unfortunately, the COVID, you know, uh, situation kind of prevented like many of us to travel, to come back to Okinawa. But now we're back. So I uh, just hope that, I just wish for everybody who hasn't been here before in their life, please do come because you, you'll be surprised how generous, great, amazing island Okinawa is with the people and the culture. Aside from karate, karate is amazing, kobudo is amazing, there's no doubt about that, but overall, it's a great experience. It changed your life, definitely.